sometimes I suspect that the theological stuff going on in this is is less important to Descartes than than it might seem otherwise. That it's sort of window dressing for political reasons, and that so. Well, can I give us can I give a synopsis of the five meditations? So we we had assigned that is the thing that we had said at the end of the last podcast, and that will be on the link that folks uh, following along in here you you don't have to, but you can read the first two meditations, and those are the the ones that we're going to focus on in our discussion. The first meditation covers this uh, method of doubt, so it's the the entire philosophical enterprise, which is to say. I've been uh, misled a lot in my past. There are a lot of things that I believed were true that turned out not to be true. So I'm going to start off my brand new philosophical enterprise by trying to doubt everything. The second meditation. Okay, now that I've doubted everything and I've dwelt with that for an evening, I'm going to see if I try to doubt everything. Is there something that is just indubitable? And he comes to the conclusion there that, well, the fact that I exist, that there is someone doing the doubting must exist. The third meditation, so that's where we stop, and as far as I'm concerned, that's where the good argumentation stops, though you can dispute me on that. The third meditation covers, well, I know I exist. Is there anything else I can assume uh, that I can prove exists, you know, with absolute deductive certainty? And he comes up with the existence of God using a variation of an old medieval argument for the existence of God that's very lame, and I don't think we really should talk about it in any depth. <laughs> I think we should have a, a later episode covering uh, medieval philosophers and, and things they love to talk about, like their arguments for the existence of God. So everything after this point relies on that very lame proof for the existence of God. The fourth meditation being, is God a deceiver? If God exists and he's all good, well, how do I know he's not deceiving me about a lot of stuff? And then the fifth one, after ever having concluded that he is not a deceiver, uh, is to say, uh, is to prove everything else, right? Is to say, well, since he's not a deceiver, then all the things I think about, you know, that I found science on is material things. Since God tells me that, you know, my senses tell me all the time that there they are. It's sort of, it's sort of like God is telling me these things and we've shown that God is not a deceiver. We'll just say material objects exist as well. That's what the fifth and sixth meditations cover. The sixth meditation goes also into the difference between this uh, mind, right? The I that I've discovered in the second meditation exists and body, right? The material things that in the fifth meditation I've discovered existed. That sound, that's a pretty good sum up. Yeah, I think we're done. Who would like to start us on what is so ungodly important about meditations one and or two? Well, let me go ahead. There were a couple things about this that I thought were really interesting, at least to start off. Um, in some ways, I'm really fascinated by this concept that, you know, he says, I traveled a lot when I was a youth and I went to all these foreign lands and I sort of learned that things that I thought were, were true weren't. It's basically, he talks about how his experience and being exposed to other cultures and things like that helped sort of disabuse him of prejudices or ideas that he learned in his, you know, his own. But then even further, he's essentially retired, right? And he's suggesting that this activity of doing philosophy is a reflective activity that's better reserved for the mature, the, you know, the retired, the old, that now that he's filled his life full of experience, he can sit back and actually do philosophy. And, you know, I was just thinking in terms of comparing that to the idea of going to school like we did when we were, you know, in our 20s. And this this idea that there are so many other things that are reserved for the young, but he's basically saying, I couldn't do my good thinking until I had lived my life and done all the things I was going to do. And now that I'm retired and I'm sitting in front of the fire and kind of drowsing off to sleep and smoking a pipe, I can and actually do... Some- he puts a parenthetical in there, and and now that he has no bodily passions, <laughs> yes, which is very interesting. Now, I, I always found my bodily passions to to make me a better thinker, but uh, that that reminds me actually, there was a um, at the college I went to. I went to this place called Reed College, which was kind of a, a hippie school, but also very intense academically, and there was. At one point in time, people were circulating T-shirts that said, um, 
It was the Reed College Celibacy Society, and the motto was, and I don't know Latin, so I'm not going to claim that this is correct, but Caelibus um, usque studiatum, or something along those lines, like celibacy in order that we may study. <laughs> totally irrelevant, sorry. <clears throat> no, it's relevant. Um, but the idea that ex you have to live your life and then stop living it in order to do philosophy, I found fascinating. How's that sound? We'll leave it at that. Well, he also did a lot of his philosophy in bed, right? And I'm not, I'm not <laughs> making that up. That he used to spend the entire morning in bed, sitting around, you know, writing his philosophy, reading his philosophy. And this is, in fact, one of the most, the, the, the points of Descartes' life that I have found most inspiring, that is, I have referenced it most in my everyday life, is the way he finally died, which is he got a new job that made him get up in the morning consistently and he wasn't used to doing that and it screwed up his immune system and he died so <laughs> getting up early in the morning is ungodly and will kill you yeah it was a tutoring job i think yes even worse for the swedish <laughs> the swedish princess he made his living as a yeah as a live-in tutor for kids basically so okay so you let's saying, get on no, no, no. I, I just, I, I found that. I just, I find this to be a very personal and, and very, it's one of my favorite texts because I think it's, it's something that speaks to, you know, the average, you know, the average person can read this and say, like, I totally get what he's saying, right? Like, I, sometimes I fall asleep and I think I'm awake and I have this half dreaming state and, you know, um, I just think there's a lot of really nice little images in it, and I especially like the fact at the end of the first meditation, he goes, oh, but now I'm tired. Time to go to bed. Like, like, <laughs> like, why even write that down? Why not just end the first meditation and start? And it's like, oh, oh my back. Um, because yeah, it's, it's, that, it's is... very personal for a, for a philosophical treatise, and I, of course that's intentionally so, and it, it sort of goes towards what he's trying to – what he's trying to demonstrate or talk about, but it's, it is it because it's like a diary at the same time. Yes. Okay. Right, and so... I think that's a natural, I think that's a natural state for philosophy. That's is how, you know, why I had s such trouble for a long time writing philosophy papers, because actually contrary to what I was just saying about, about philosophy in general, when you write a philosophy paper now that's to be published, you just revise the bejesus out of it. Like you can't have, a sort of stream of consciousness account of your own brilliant thoughts, even that's though that's the starting point. That's what you start writing. Um, you really have to have something that's broken down into very defined steps. And if you can chart the damn thing out in formal logic, all the better. Right. Uh, but it's, a lot of these classic philosophers that we read, like, well, I, I don't think Descartes is the, the, the prime example of this, but certainly Nietzsche and uh, some of the others, you know, were much more like that. You know, you have to be much more patient with them and follow their their thoughts as they were just brimming out of their brilliant minds. <laughs> yeah, and I think this is part of what we confronted at the University of Texas, which is the professionalization of philosophy and what that means. The you know, the, this is, it's one thing to love philosophy and then to to have that personal attachment to it. It's another to become a professional. And to have to do the sort of things that go along with that, some of which are not necessarily that intellectually honest, like scrubbing papers of personal references to oneself and of anything personal in order to make it seem objective or scientific. Um, and yet when I read Des someone like Descartes, it, it is refreshing that he's willing to be so personal. He doesn't have to... Uh, pretend to be this very professional scientist or academic philosopher. Well, yeah, he may, he makes a point of not referring to other texts, which is the, the big thing that makes it so hard and annoying to write philosophy professionally that you can't just have an original thought. You have to say what existing thoughts in the literature it relates to. So it, it requires much, you know, you, you have some germ of an idea and then you have to go research everybody that has thought anything about that, and you realize that your idea is kind of pathetic compared to a lot of the things out there, and, and you end up just writing a critique of some or synthesis of stuff that already is out there, and 
you know, maybe at, after you've written your fifth book, you'll get to put in a, an actual original thought. I'm pretty sure that the last original thought in philosophy happened sometime just after the Second World War, and that we've just <laughs> basically been rehashing things since. Hmm. Or uh, that everything is a footnote to Plato. <laughs> to, to quote an unnamed, uh, to quote a philosopher who I who I won't name. Uh, yeah. All right. So let's. I, I want to get right at this this idea that <clears throat> he starts off saying that everything that he knows um, he's received through his senses. Right. That basically Does he everything, say everything he or just a lot of the stuff that I think that I know most certainly comes through my senses? Because a lot of things he knows because he's been told by people. It's not everything he knows. Uh, I think that's a good question. I think he says something like all that I have learned, all that I have up to this moment as accepted as possessed of the highest truth and certainty I received either from or through the senses. Sure. Right. It's He's saying that the senses – that the natural assumption is that our perceptions of things outside of us are the most certain things and that internal reflections are, in fact, very murky. Yeah, okay, so seeing is believing. If somebody tells me something, maybe I don't believe it until I, I do, the, do the logic or you know, see it for myself. Yeah, and I think it's even, I think it's even a little bit, uh, there's, a, there's more to it than that and that he's saying, like, that there's there's a certain kind of visceral experience or a visceral nature of experience that that makes it so sure for you like how you know i'm sitting right here i can't doubt that i'm sitting here in a chair in front of the fire i, I just i can't doubt if it's raining outside or if the sun is shining or if the you know, trees are green like that's just got this concrete visceral reality right and that mm -hmm. that the this is going to be critical and a little bit later when he talks about dreaming, right? That another fascinating point for me, but that he says, you can hardly be sure of anything more so than you can be sure of the fact that you have a body and that the body gets cold or warm and that you see things and all that kind of stuff. Right. Sure. Okay. Um, and then he says, but then he immediately, you know, so first off, I guess the question is, do you, do you guys believe that? Like, I mean, as a premise, as a starting premise to say, like, Maybe we've lived, you know, the 300 years since Descartes and this has been rehashed a million times and all that. And now people don't have the same kind of confidence. But do we have any kind of context for why he would make that statement and whether people would believe it? I think a lot of people would. I mean, if a lot of people are, you know, it's I'm from Missouri. Show me. Right. Well, he's going to, of course, where we're, we're leading with this, it's, he's going to reject that. Right. He's saying it seems that way. That's the kind of thing that seem to me to, to be the case but by the by the end of the second meditation and it sort of caps off the second meditation is the idea that ah in fact my awareness of myself something that might seem very murky is in fact much more certain than my awareness of those objects but of course that's that's the uh that's the sort of ending conclusion is it so just to get at Seth's question is it is it that our natural propensity to think that those sort of sensory perceptions are the most certain. Do you have to buy that in order for him to launch this whole thing? And if so, is it something that you can buy? Well, and it, it would be interesting to think about how, if that's not our natural propensity, you know, just the seeing is believing, which I, I do think is certainly pretty prominent in our intuitions, but how much, if we disagree with that, if we think, you know, there's some sort of inner reflection is giving us things more immediately, how much is that is, is due to Descartes' influence itself? You know, because it just can't be underestimated how much this affected Western philosophy, you know, even before it was an arcane, a very focused discipline for the very few, you know, when it was still influencing popular culture. So his ideas are definitely out there. 